everybody. Uh, my name is Anne Mulroney, and as director of the Science Gallery, I'm really pleased to welcome you here this evening to the first event in our Living With series in partnership with ICON. ICON is one of the world's largest global research companies. Founded and headquartered in Ireland in 1990, ICON's 14,000 employees in pharma, biotech, and medical devices um, excuse me, help companies to bring new medicines to market which are benefiting patients right across the world. And they've contributed hugely to the development of 18 of the world's top selling drugs. ICON has been a partner of the Science Gallery since our inception 11 years ago and we're delighted to partner with them on this new event series. In this series, we'll be exploring healthcare, the human experience, and the future of dis disease treatment in a way that we hope is engaging, stimulating, and drives conversations. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping tips for this evening, so please take a moment now to take your phones out and make sure that they're switched off or on silent. And also please note the fire exit, so the closest one uh, to the front is down here and there are also the two doors that you came in this evening. Dr. Kira Kelly will be our MC for this evening and she will introduce our panellists. I hope you enjoy the evening and I look forward to welcoming you to our uh, future Living With series events. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, you're all very welcome. This evening, obviously, this is the first of a series of talks on the idea of living with major diseases. Uh, we're going to talk about HIV tonight. HIV, I, I suppose, has changed radically in many ways in how we think about it. What was once considered a death sentence, maybe in the 80s, and would have been in some way a cause celeb and would have been something people were terrified of getting and would have gotten huge attention. It has largely fallen off the radar for a lot of people now and we don't hear nearly as much about it and that is probably to do with changes that have taken place in terms of treatment over the past 30 years or so. We have a panel this evening who are going to discuss the different aspects of living with HIV, of being a researcher in the area of vaccines, of being a clinician, uh, and we're going to talk about social stigma around men who have sex with men having HIV, and obviously towards the end we will take questions from the floor, and we'd love if you got involved and uh, asked any of our panellists what you want to know about this subject. I'm going to introduce them now. Uh, on the end here, we have <laughs> over here, we have Adam Shanley, who uh, is the programme manager with HIV Ireland. Gay, bisexual and uh, MSM, which is men who have sex with men, are disproportionately affected by HIV and by STIs in Ireland. And Adam's role is to respond to the sexual health and well-being needs of this community by developing innovative interventions and services. And HIV Ireland is a non-profit organisation whose mission is to contribute to significant reduction in the incidence and in the prevalence of HIV in Ireland and towards the realisation of an AIDS-free generation. And I think we would all support those aims. Beside him here is Thomas Strong, who is a member of ACT UP, which is handy because it's on the T-shirt, and is a lecturer in anthropology at Maynooth University. And Thomas has been living with HIV since 2006. We're just saying that's 13 years now. We'll talk about that too. And in 2016, he wrote an opinion piece in the Irish Times uh, entitled, How Can There Be Such a Thing as Guilty or, H or Innocent rather <coughs> HIV? About how we might view certain patients who have HIV. This uh, lady here is Caroline Forkin, is a medical doctor by background since 1994 and formerly worked in the Guide Clinic, which some of you will be familiar with in St. James's, the genital urinary and infectious disease clinics, um, and subsequently went to Mozambique in the early noughties and has worked as a HIV advisor to the World Bank and a HIV advisor for Irish Aid. And a lot of her focus at this time was about moving forward a treatment agenda for uh, Africa for HIV, which many people will know is endemic <coughs> in areas. And obviously, treatment access is not as good. And her focus was on getting lower priced uh, antiretroviral agents and a scaling up of prevention of mother to child transmission and also on combating the stigma around HIV and promoting testing and awareness. Uh, of people's HIV status and safe sex practices. This is Professor Nigel Stevenson, who is an assistant professor of immunology here at Trinity. And uh, Professor Stevenson's research analyzes how viruses target our immune system. And obviously HIV is one of such viruses and uh, his research has been refunded, has been funded rather by the Irish Research Board and the Science Foundation of Ireland. And he has recently published a new mechanism 
through which HIV blocks innate immunity and explains to us um, why HIV remains sadly virtually impossible to cure which is not what we want to start the conversation this okay. evening. Yeah. Um, I might come to you, Caroline. Caroline, you've worked in this area for 20 years between Ireland and indeed Africa. We're talking tonight about the 90-90-90 programme. Would you explain maybe first of all to the audience what that is and where we're at with it? Yeah, perfect. So I think everybody will have seen on the way in, you know, 90-90-90. In, in any health sector around the world, we all get used to hearing these targets being set periodically. They come around with alarming frequency, but they're set for very good reasons to try and drive forward an agenda to kind of direct action and also for accountability at a global level. So what is the 1990-90 UNAIDS agenda? It was set in 2013 by UNAIDS. Um, it's part of UNAIDS kind of overall trajectory, if you like, they call their fast track trajectory to 2030 in which they want the world to no longer be living with the public uh, health threat of AIDS. So they want to reduce new infections to such a level, 200,000 per year, by 2030, that it's no longer considered a public health threat. So the 1990-90, if you like, they're kind of park benches along the way to getting there. 90 people, they want 90% of the world's HIV positive um, population to be aware of their status, so to know their diagnosis, know that they're living with HIV. Of that proportion of people, they want 90% of those to be on sustainable, um, sustained antiretroviral treatment. And out of that cohort of people, they want 90% of those to achieve viral suppression. And we'll probably hear throughout the course of the evening, you know, viral suppression of HIV has become one of the central tenets, if you like, of a comprehensive prevention strategy for, for HIV. So that's what it is. And I suppose, where are we and where are we going to get to? This is 1990-90 by 2020, which is next year. So if we look globally, the latest figures, which are actually from 2017, would show that 75% of the world's population are aware of their, diagnos their diagnosis. Of that group, 79% are on sustained antiretroviral treatment. And then of that group, 81% have achieved viral suppression. So that's pretty good if you think 2017, 2020, you know, we'll have updated figures uh, fairly shortly. But there's still a ways to go. And if we look at the UNAIDS report from last year, 2018, it's no coincidence that the title of that report is called Miles to Go. So, you know, it, it, it does put it in context, but I think if you look back from where we've come, it's been huge progress. And Ireland specifically, uh, you know, looking up the figures for how we're doing with respect to that, 87% of people in Ireland who are HIV positive were aware of their diagnosis in, in 2017, and then 83% of those were on sustained antiretroviral treatment. And of that, 95% uh, had achieved suppression. So, you know, I think credit where credit is due. I know we still have a lot of challenges here with respect to many aspects of, of HIV, but we've achieved one of the targets and we're very close to achieving the other two. So I think that puts some context around it. It certainly does. And just maybe for, for people listening, why is viral, full viral suppression so important? So viral suppression means that the, the, the viral load, which is, uh, if, if you like, the, the, the amount of virus that's replicating actively in your system at any one time, is, is undetectable in your system, so such that it is untransmissible. So I think that's the key point. So why have they made viral suppression one of these key targets? Is so that it is actually uns unsuppressible, uh, untransmissible, my apologies. And like I said, treatment, rather than being kind of one sort of hierarchical end of a management of HIV has become very central to how we manage it for that very reason, because it's now what you call part of a combined prevention, evidence-based prevention approach to HIV. So that's why it's so important. And just lastly, before I, I bring in the other panelists, obviously we're over hitting that target mm. here, as in we're 95% of men who are on uh, antiviral therapies mm. are, are, are fully suppressed in terms of their viral load. But why are we not hitting that globally? Is there a reason why some people would be on treatment and not have their uh, viral <coughs> load fully suppressed? I, I guess if you look, you know, it's not a heterogeneous epidemic across the globe and if you look at some of the areas geographically that are disproportionately affected they're some of the poorest areas uh, in the world so if you look at the health systems around you know sub-saharan africa parts of asia they're not able to maybe service you know the the, the patients who are hiv positive in the same way that we would be on this side of the world so and maintaining access problem. access access um, but also being able to stay on 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 you know uninterrupted antiretroviral treatment which sometimes is is nigh on impossible if you're living in a 
a village somewhere in rural Africa. I suppose funding also. You funding, know, not yeah. everybody has access to treatment yeah, that, because mm. of costs. Yeah. yeah. I might, I, I do want to get to all the, the research, but I might bring you in next, Adam, if you don't mind. Obviously, you work uh, with men who has, have sex with men community. Has the view on the stigma of HIV and has the view on the seriousness of HIV as an infection changed or evolved, do you think, over the last number of years? I think we, uh, well, speaking specifically about the gay and, gay and bisexual community, uh, male community, um, I think we're much more engaged on the topic of HIV. I think uh, particularly in the kind of 80s and 90s, uh, like we have a huge legacy of being involved in the response to HIV and AIDS uh, as a community. Um, and I think with the advent of anti antiretroviral treatment, um, as you kind of said in your opening, you know, the topic of HIV did kind of fall off the table somewhat. Um, and it's only kind of been in the last number of years that um, as we see an increasing number of new HIV notifications in, in Ireland, but also, you know... A in significant climb in cases. There is, yeah, there's been, a, there's, uh, there's been a, a consistent rise a year on year rise since 2011 here in Ireland, and, and <coughs> gay and bisexual men and, and, and other men who have sex with men are disproportionately affected by that. Um, but to say that we wouldn't consider it uh, serious or to think that there's, a, that there's not... Um, that we don't consider it something that we need to be aware of, I wouldn't agree with. I think um, I, I used to work in the Gay Men's Health Service, which is, which is Ireland's um, statutory service for, for gay and bisexual men for their sexual health and wellbeing needs, um, and also run a, a rapid HIV testing program where we test, uh, we do uh, finger prick HIV testing in bars and clubs um, and sex on premises venues. And any time any of us have ever uh, given a diagnosis, well, it's not a diagnosis, but ever given a, a, you know, a reactive result in that scenario. Um, no one has ever you know, reacted in there, oh, well, okay, that's fine. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not life stopping, but it's definitely going to change in the way in which you're going to live the rest of your life. So it's not, it's not mm -hmm. something that I think people have a laissez-faire attitude towards. Um, and I actually think, as I say, in the last number of years, as a community, <coughs> we have found that you know, legacy of activism, um, and I think uh, there's a huge appetite for, uh, for change. There's a lot that needs to happen for us to tackle those rising rates, and I think the community is at the forefront of that fight. Okay. I might bring you in as well, Tom. Tom, you have spoken about living with HIV, you've written about HIV. As somebody who has lived with HIV for the past 15 or so years, um, what has that meant to your life? How, how has it affected you and what has, has it been like and what has changed from maybe before you would have been diagnosed with HIV and after you were diagnosed with HIV? Uh, so uh, w the main thing I would just emphasize is that living with HIV, I mean, it, the, 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 a, sep a lot of the medical problems and health dimensions, if you're in a, in a rich country with a good healthcare system and you're able to access care as I am, um, the medical aspect kind of fades away a little bit. Like, I, I don't think about it all the time. I just take my pills when I go to bed, et cetera. And it's, it's okay. The social dimension is hugely consequential. And in fact, I would just underline that in regard to the discussion in general. So, I mean, we can ask ourselves, you know, we have the means to suppress the virus, right? We have the means to test people. So why haven't we already reached the 1990 targets? Why aren't we already there? Is it a scientific problem? No, it's a political and a moral problem. It's a social problem. The reason that we haven't reached these targets is because of the inequalities that structure access to care, access to medical systems, the inequalities that underline or under sort of gird the system of provision of pharmaceuticals globally. So rich countries get them and poor countries don't. Right? So that's actually why we haven't reached those targets. So it's not really a technological or scientific problem, it's really a political and moral problem. And I live that as a person living with HIV because I live with the stigma of what it means to live with HIV. So um, I take my pills, I'm grand. I used to look a little more healthy than I do at the moment, but um, I feel okay, right? And that's all right. But what I receive back actually is a lot of condemnation and judgment, right? Including 
surprisingly, especially in the LGBT community. So a lot of gay men, for example, would want to distance themselves from um, the stigma associated with uh, people who are living with HIV. And the reason I say that, and the reason I underline that, is that this idea that people would suddenly are, are more cavalier now because it's a treatable illness just does not rhyme or make sense to me with my experience. Because what I see is people being extremely scared of the virus, right? Of the diagnosis. Or extremely judgmental towards those people who have it, right? So it's so the notion that people might be a little bit more relaxed about the uh, uh, the, the disease now just doesn't make sense in a context where they're also freaked out by and hyper judgmental towards people who have HIV, right? Can can I just ask you to, to tease that out a little bit, Tom? But like, what are they judging you for? They're hardly judging you, particularly within the the, the gay and bisexual community, for having sex with men. So why are they mm -hmm. judging you for contracting a, a, an infection that people who mm -hmm. have sex? contract, mm -hmm. but where is the judgment? Well, they're I judging you because it's a sexually contracted disease. So it's a stigmatized disease precisely because it has to do with sex, right? So what happens is that, oh, you must be somebody who engaged in some behaviors that are not okay. We're the good guys. We're the good gays. We're the HIV, we're the HIV negative folks, whereas those people with HIV, must have, they must have been promiscuous, <coughs> they must have been reckless, they must have been risky, etc. So the meaning of HIV, that stigma, um, has to do with feelings about sex and moral judgments about good sex versus bad sex, and that's what's carried in. And, and you know, it's something that occurs in the gay community. It's something that obviously occurs in the straight community. And one of the reasons that, um, that HIV is a political illness is precisely because for, uh, you know, the many, many years in which it wasn't treatable and in which uh, people looked the other way and didn't care about it was precisely because they thought that those people who had HIV deserved their fate. That is, that it was a moral judgment on their behavior, right? And you think so the legacy of that is with us there. today, hugely. And I including in Ireland, including in the United States, including elsewhere, actually. Okay, thank you. Let me bring you in, Nigel. We're, you know, we're talking about treatments, we're talking about... Um, <coughs> cures and vaccines and, and, and those kinds of ideas. Obviously people take pre-exposure medication now and, mm -hmm. and, and that's a whole new area. Why has the HIV virus proved so difficult when we know so much about it and yeah. it's so widely studied and we understand about our DNA and our RNA and we understand about our immune systems so much now? Why has it proved so difficult to cure? I think it's probably uh it's a long answer. Uh, That's good. We have time. <laughs> um, but one of the key things is that HIV uh, chops your DNA and pops its DNA into your cells, and that remains in there. And every time you uh, you go off antiretroviral, the HIV could kickstart and recover, basically. Um, we found in Trinity, um, we all wondered there's this molecule uh, that if you get infected with any virus is produced by your cells and it's called interferon. Mm -hmm. And people might recognize interferon, it was used for treatment for hepatitis C, um, but it's a natural molecule that's produced in our cells. And it actually induces hundreds of antiviral genes and these all act in different ways to clear viral infection. And if you get a cold or a flu, uh, this will kickstart and clears the virus. And I suppose our main research question here at Trinity in my group uh, were why, does, why do some viruses, if interferon's so amazing, why do some viruses actually avoid that? And um, we started looking at that with hepatitis C, actually, because in Ireland uh, there were so many people infected through the anti-D cohort, and this was a very topical uh, subject uh, here, and we looked uh, that some of the patients that were treated that had a specific type of hepatitis C, only 50% of them responded to this interferon treatment. And uh, we kind of think when interferon hits the cells, it starts activating what we call a signaling pathway. And we think of these signaling pathways as kind of like a, a row of dominoes. dominoes. And, and interferon, interferon binds to the outside, outside of the, of the cell. cell. And, and if, if you get, get any viral infection, infection you'll, you'll start, start to produce that, that and have this reaction. reaction. The, the first dominoes is pushed over, and then, then it works its way right down into the cell and upregulates hundreds of these antiviral genes. genes. And this, this is kind of like the fanfare that you see sometimes at the end of domino, trendy dominoes. Um, but what we found was that actually HIV and hepatitis C take some of those dominoes out. 
and the interferon signaling pathway can't work. So you can't get the upregulation of antiviral genes. And we think that that's probably why we can't cure HIV, because your innate, uh, basic, uh, inbuilt interferon response is being blocked by HIV. Okay, I, I suppose that's what we mean by it being an immune, a, a virus that attacks our immune system. Exactly. So yeah. what we should be using to, to cure it and to tackle it is the fundamental building blocks that it's actually undermining. Well, uh, are we ever going to cure it? <laughs> what uh, our, oh, so we found out that basic discovery. Now what we think we need to do is actually restore the interferon response because HIV is still targeting your natural interferon response. And if we could bring back those missing dominoes, uh, then we could actually upregulate the normal antiviral genes. Like these are, there's hundreds of antiviral genes. We probably know the function of 20 to 30 of them. And some of them block viruses from getting into the cell. Some of them chop up the viral DNA. Some of them even start a cell to die so that effectively the virus is taken down with the ship when the cell dies. So if we could restore those functions, uh, we might be able to get over the hump of actually clearing the virus. And is there research actively going on into restoring the dominoes, as you say? And is it likely that we will see that in the short to medium term, or is that unstable? That's our next step, yeah, okay. so um, uh, we are, are focusing on that um, and we're collaborating with people around the world to get resources into thinking about this. And, and this may be an additional treatment that goes alongside antiretroviral therapy or even there's other types of new therapies that kind of try to restore uh, the virus and that your whole immune system uh, detects it. Uh, which some people think could work, and if we were able to add interferon, you might be able to actually target that and get rid of it. Okay. Um, I want to come back to maybe both Adam and Tom uh, and get kind of a, a, a joint response from you. Uh, we were talking before the, 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 this lecture series started and about obviously men who have sex with men are disproportionately affected by HIV, not just in Ireland but throughout the world. And the response of your community to that, how they are dealing with it. I talked to you just before and I mentioned safe sex and you both looked at me and said, what do you mean by safe sex? And I kind of, in my perhaps naivety, went condoms. And tell me why you both slightly bristled when I said that. What, what, safe sex, perhaps, as, as my background being that of a medic, um, might be viewed in one way, but is it the case that the, the gay and bisexual community views safe sex a little bit differently? Either of you, both of you. Do you want that? Um, yeah, we can, we can tag team on that answer, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can tag um, team. I think it's probably, ta it's probably a bit of a, a well-worn term, but I think you need to meet people where they are. Um, I think what we need to do when we, when we think about safer sex, like, first of all, I think one of, one of the kind of things that kind of gets me in my stomach is when we talk about uh, sex, we also talk quite a lot about risk, right? Um, your risk of HIV, your risk of, of STIs. Um, and I think that kind of pathologizes sex. Sex is there to be enjoyed. Uh, it's pleasurable. Um, and so I think that's the standpoint that we need to start from. Uh, we need to look at how people feel, first of all, making as many, as, as much of the prevention toolkit available to people um, and then working with those people to figure out what's best for them. So for example, if condoms are absolutely off the table, um, having an understanding that you're more vulnerable to acquiring HIV and STIs by not using condoms, but there's other options available. So PEP, PrEP, like testing and treatment. I think one of the things that, you know, one of the ongoing difficulties I have is when people you know, wave the condom as absolute king. Um, if someone comes to the clinic and they've got gonorrhea every single month, the amazing thing is that they're coming to the clinic and getting tested and treated. And the more that, and often the, the more often that they do that, uh, the better the chance you're going to break the cycle of transmission. Right? Condoms don't work for that person. What is it that can work for that person? So I think safer sex means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. We need to kind of 
stand back and allow the person having the sex talk about what it is that's going to work for them. That's kind of where I'd stand. Yeah, I totally agree with Adam. And I would just um, add that um, the reason that that's a little bit controversial or it's, a, it's sort of a political or contentious kind of question has to do with there is a kind of discourse of wanting to discipline gay men around, uh, around or all people, but especially gay men, because we're the, we're the bad guys out there being promiscuous and restless and enjoying sex too much, um, um, <clears throat> uh, around, around their sexual behaviors. And the condom has come to signify that, like, and, and, and so on. But the interesting thing is that if, so amaz the epidemic has totally changed. Right? It is a different epidemic now. The medications mean that the, that the nature of the, of the disease actually is just very different than it was back in the day when condoms had a certain kind of significance, right? So among the amazing things that the medications do, apart from suppressing virus in populations so that fewer people get infected, and keeping those of us with HIV alive, which I don't think is a footnote exactly, but um, 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 <laughs> is that they pre can be used to prevent HIV transmission, right? So, so um, one of the ways in which that can occur is pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is taking it prophylactically, taking a drug like, for example, Truvada um, or a generic um, derivative thereof, um, to protect yourself against HIV infection. Um, and what's happened is that because of the meaning of condoms as this thing that signify responsible good sex, um, PrEP has been condemned in some way as being irresponsible, a party drug, reckless, or whatever. But if you are taking pre-exposure prophylaxis responsibly on a daily basis, you actually are acting very responsibly to protect yourself. Right? And in fact, PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, is a safer way to avoid HIV than our condoms if you look strictly in terms of the statistics of risk. Right? So the reason that we bristle around that a little bit has to do with the way in which um, that, that kind of thinking is usually used to condemn an, uh, an incredibly um, wonderful and powerful new tool for preventing HIV infection, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis. You see what I mean? So, no, I, do so see, I totally see what you mean, and I, I, really, I really want to hear this, because I think this is something that perhaps the likes of me is, is, was less aware of. So what you're saying is, is how, how you view safe sex or safer sex is that you manage risk, not necessarily through, through condoms, which is always kind of was the, I suppose, what people were recommended to do. You are looking at safe sex through the prism of well, what kind of medications can we take to protect ourselves, and that's a form of safe sex that you yeah. find more acceptable. Is that? Well, I mean, I, they're both acceptable to me. I don't know. I mean, I think most people. I mean, what you do is you find a way that works for you. Yeah. Right. And that 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 that's the important thing, and not whether or not you know it's the it, it signifies some other thing about you that you are a good person or whatever. It's like if it works for you, keeps you healthy, then you know. That's great. Can I ask you, because I, I, I mentioned to you both earlier that I was talking to a, a, a young Dublin gay man, and he was saying that in his circle, he is somebody who uses condoms, but he is in a minority of the people he knows who, who, who is willing to do that. And he said, in fact, on various you know, dating apps and hookup apps and all sorts of stuff, he's been blocked by people because he said, no, I use a condom, and, he, and, and that didn't go down well with a lot of people. Is condom use? in and of itself stigmatized? Are there people who stigmatize men? Because you, you've used a little bit that idea, Tom, of, of you know, good, well-behaved mm -hmm. sex mm -hmm. and bad, you mm -hmm. know, bold, risky sex, and, and mm -hmm. kind of that there's a judgment maybe inherent mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. Are condoms now seen as somehow boring? I mean, a lot of people don't like them, but a lot of people use them for, I suppose, reasons of, of maybe being a bit sensible. That, that, I suppose, is the reason to use them. Are they in themselves stigmatized in a way, do you think? I'm only oh. asking the questions. I, I mean, I would love to hear from people in the audience. We're going to get question. to this audience. We're going to be asking you all what you, you think about condoms, section. how often you use them, and all yeah. of that. We're going to get to all no, that. But, well, but, actually, the thing is, nobody really likes condoms. Nobody really likes them. They're like not that great. They never were. And if you look at the usage in terms of, con if you actually look at behavioral research in terms of condom use, even back in the, the worst days of the epidemic and so on, it really hasn't fluctuated all that much. People just are not that into them, frankly. And that's why PrEP is so powerful, is because the message of condoms, I mean, if it was easy to get people to use condoms all the time, the epidemic would have been over ages ago. So people just don't really like them, you know what I mean? Um, so it's, it, I don't know that there's stigma. There is a weird thing. There's a really deep 
inside baseball subcultural moment around some of the meanings of condom do you, use. Do you, but but, but I think used the, as like a stick to beat gay men with, as in you know, yeah. if y'all were using condoms, you'd be fine. Is there something like? Cause what, I sense that you're not telling me something. No, I just want to underline. I don't no, know. no, the important. There's another important dimension here, which is that not everybody has the same agency in sexual encounters, such that they can request condoms to be used or whatever. So, for example, women in 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 certain kinds of contexts might actually be seriously constrained by the um, gender inequality and the kind of sexual agency that women are allowed. In that context, for example, you have to rethink, okay, well, how do condoms enter into this scene? PrEP then becomes, or treatment as prevention, then becomes a really interesting alternative to that sacred cow of it must be a condom every time kind of thing. So I think it's worth considering that kind of situation as well. Yes. I, I think we probably have to remember about the other uh, sexually transmitted mm -hmm. diseases that mm -hmm. Um, like gonorrhea and syphilis that aren't protected by PrEP. Sure. Um, so um, we're on a cliff of antibiotic resistance yeah. uh, globally. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, you know, there's a balancing act. Of course, PrEP is brilliant in that it will eventually whittle away HIV, if that's all we, the only problem we had. And that is... Because uh, people won't be able to transmit it exactly, and therefore the cohort yeah, who have it are dwindling. It'll vanish, yeah. Yeah. That's um, great. I think but just to just to respond to that, yeah, I think like there's there's two major elements that are, are going to end uh, uh, HIV transmissions, and PrEP is one of them. Also, as we said, viral suppression or U equals U that campaign, mm -hmm. you, un, being undetectable equals untransmittability. Uh, that's a new word, isn't it? I've just added an ability at the end. <laughs> um, um, but I think like this is this is a narrative that is and a dangerous narrative that is building around prep use. And I do absolutely understand that there's concern around uh, antimicrobial resistance, particularly in gonorrhea. We're on yeah. our last kind of uh, antibiotic there. Um, but I think one of the wonderful things about prep is that it engages a whole bunch of people who a may have not been wearing condoms anyway. Um, and then also B, who, who haven't crossed the threshold of a sexual health clinic in a very long time. When, when we talk about PrEP, we talk about PrEP as not just a pill, it's a program. So there's a lot of monitoring that goes on. Uh, you, you would, you would, uh, you'd access uh, your sexual health clinic or a PrEP monitoring clinic at least uh, every three months. Right. And alongside that, you not only get a, a, a HIV test to ensure that you know, you're adhering to the PrEP properly and you're staying HIV negative, but you're also being tested for all of the STIs. So you're actually being tested potentially much, much more regularly than you ever would have been before, and therefore being able to, if there was a, a, an infection, catch it early, treat it early, and stop the transmission of, the, of, of STIs. So actually, PrEP also not only has a HIV, a benefit in, in preventing HIV, it also, looking longer term, has a, a, a benefit in reducing the burden of STIs in the community too. Take, sorry. No, if, if you, you know, uh, again, coming back to some of the elements that were picked up on earlier on, there's no one approach that should supersede uh, all other approaches. And if you look at the global approach to prevention, there's no doubt that it's multifaceted. You know, there's no doubt that condoms do play a large part across globally amongst different populations. Particularly populations that, as you said, maybe don't have access. Yeah, to exactly, a absolutely. Yeah, so, so that that is does remain one key element. But so also does you know key key population services for for those key populations, which would be gay men, bisexual men, transgender people, you know, people who inject drugs, sex workers, etc. And then obviously in certain like some of the areas of the world I've worked in, you know, the young women and adolescent girls and their male partners because they're a very vulnerable group in that particular scenario, making sure that they have access to you know, health, um, health services and sexual health services and all the supports there. But then also the other elements, which one of which would be PrEP, which is increasingly important. Um, and then secondly, again, in, in a broader public health, sexual health context, voluntary medical um, male circumcision. And again, this is maybe more in the developing world kind of uh, yeah. public health approach, but it's obviously something that is, again, increasing rapidly in terms of uptake and its importance, and not insofar as PrEP uh, in terms of its impact, but kind of a 60% um, protective, 60% uh, reduction in, in, in risk. So, you know, and then obviously you have your, your treatment piece in the middle of all of that and trying to bring people down to. Karen, in terms of the global response, you're talking about the individual uh, facets that might be needed. It's interesting, you listed a load of people who are at mm. risk 
and they struck me as, as largely vulnerable or marginalised people. You're yeah, talking about like key, key yes. populations. Gay uh, men, bisexual yeah. men, mm -hmm. you know, particularly mm -hmm. young women, transgender yeah. people. You were, uh, all of them maybe kind of, when you think about what Tom mentioned, about people maybe don't have agency. Yeah. Maybe yeah. you don't yeah. have an ability to Absolutely. demand someone else yeah. to use a condom, for yeah. example, that, yeah. that they aren't in a position of, of enough authority or equality to Absolutely. actually be able to assert and themselves. You know, Tom made the very good point about the, you know, in certain situ situations it might be the woman who doesn't have agency and very often, yeah. you know, in, in sub-Saharan Africa that would definitely be the case. And if you look at some of the main challenges to, you know, bring in the epidemic to, to uh, at least reducing it as a public health threat, if you were to look at 1990, you would say diagnosis, like knowing your status, and sustained on treatment are the two main challenges, but actually it goes way beyond that. And political commitment, political, um, you know, commitment to dealing with the stigma, the discrimination, the social exclusion, but also then self-sustaining mechanisms to finance treatment, to finance research. I mean, in the world I'm in now with ICON, you know, that, that kind of drive to bring, you know, simpler, more affordable diagnostics better tolerated antiretrovirals, more affordable antiretrovirals, PrEP, um, and the quest for a vaccine, you know, and all of those challenges. And do we need a, a sort of, a, and do we have, a, obviously we have something like the 1990, but do, do we need a global response? Because obviously with an infectious disease, you might be able to control it very well in the West in a wealthy country, yeah. but if it's, if it's bubbling away in countries that don't have access to good, yeah. good healthcare systems, yeah. you will have that reservoir of infection there exactly. on the planet and at all times. You know, it's not a heterogeneous uh, illness across the globe. It's very different. However, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, the central underlying tenets of the response remain the same. They maybe just get different emphasis and different resourcing, financing, depending on the area of the world. But there's no doubt that, you know, the, the, the kind of drive um, to particularly the, the agenda around, you know, access to treatment and looking at those key populations and all of the other interventions that can ultimately drive down the rate of new infections to that kind of goal by 2030. It is very much joined up. But you know, there are challenges and if you look, you were talking earlier on about the challenges to a vaccine, not only because HIV is such a complex virus and with all of the kind of technical complexity, the world of R&D around vaccines is very complex. Yeah. I actually do want to bring you in, Nigel, on, on that, just because I, we're going to throw it open to the floor in just a moment or two. But where are we at? Because we, what we always heard in the past was that, that the real thrust of uh, research around HIV was the search for a vaccine to mm -hmm. immunise us all against it so that we could not contract it. Yeah. What is happening on that? I mean, we've been looking for this kind of, you know, magic pill for a very long time. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, um, I don't have my finger on the pulse for uh, where we are exactly right now, but I do know HIV mutates constantly, and that has been the major problem with developing a vaccine. So vaccines are either a part of the virus and you put it into your, or a, a, a dead virus or sometimes a live virus, but we wouldn't put a live HIV in. Um, and that mounts an immune response. Um, but by the time you get that immune response and you give everybody that vaccine, the virus has actually changed. We, we know uh, of other viruses population. that do it, like the flu vaccine. Yeah. Flu virus rather mutates, but it mutates seasonally, so every year is a slightly different one. Exactly, and we, we yeah. do vaccinate our, our populations with, with subtly different yeah. vaccines because yeah. it doesn't maybe change completely. Um, that approach isn't going to work for HIV. Why? Because the cohort of people who have it is, is much smaller? Uh, purely because it has such a high mutation rate. Mm -hmm. So other viruses that haven't got such a high mutation rate have been really successful in mounting an immune response. Um, we really, uh, Caroline and I are going to chat afterwards about, because there are specific regions in HIV that don't change or that we think um, may have been um, around for millions of years, but these viruses are smart. They, um, they're not alive, but they have evolved uh, to avoid our immune response. And you know, when we started working on the interference stuff, I just couldn't believe nobody had thought of this, but there's so many different ways that HIV evades our immune response. Uh, and that's partly uh, why we can't even develop a, a virus. A so it, it has evolved, is what you're saying, in yeah. a way that it just sort of is able to be like a little virus. <laughs> like I'm thinking of computers, because that's what you think about now. But yeah, it has yes. literally blocked various aspects exactly. cleverly, not just yeah. one aspect of yeah. our immune system. OK. So if you look at one of the, the, the emphasis on you know, vaccine research on broadly neutralizing antibodies, 
like it does what it says on the 10, to be able to, to, to work against HIV, you need that broad, you know, instead of just being very specific antibodies, to be able to cope yeah. with the diversity of HIV and all the subtypes and the rate at which they, uh, they, they mutate and replicate. And I suppose also with the cure uh, movement as well, uh, you know, there's, this is a pessimist in me, but there are lots of pharmaceutical companies making a lot of money out of drugs that suppress the virus and keep people alive for the rest of their lives. And is that, let's and be honest, is that more attractive? Is it more attractive to provide drugs to people who might take, who don't have HIV, who want to avoid it? So, so the people who, who are clear of HIV taking pre-exposure medication is one big group, and then there's the people who are on, you know, antiviral yeah. therapies is another big group, and that overall is more of an impetus in terms of if you were a pharmaceutical company than, than looking at a vaccine? Absolutely, and these are amazing drugs. That, that, you know, they have revolutionized. Yeah. Uh, in the 80s, people had you know, no choice, but now people can live a practically normal life. Um, but their drugs and their um, something that you don't ideally want to have to take all the time, but also the pharmaceutical companies are making money for the rest of those people's lives. Before we throw it open to the floor, just either of you, you know, we talk about antibiotic resistance and we talk about that, you know, gonorrhea, we're, we're, we're getting into difficulties there. Will there be a time when we will see uh, antiviral medication resistance to that? Because that would surely change the landscape entirely if that was the case. It's an absolute possibility. And uh, over the past uh, 20 to 30 years, the virus has become resistant to certain drugs. And people, uh, these guys, uh, Tom will know probably more than I would, but uh, people are switched on to different drugs if they become resistant to them. At the minute, I think it's one drug solution, but there are different alternatives uh, if you become resistant. So there is a possibility that tomorrow a strain of the virus could come along that is resistant. And we, that's why I think it's, uh, we have to, as a as university and as not pharmaceutical companies, have to uh, pioneer trying to get a cure and persuade the pharmaceutical companies to help us on that as well, uh, because they may have alternative uh, financial gains to not uh, do that. Okay. That's why one of the 1990-90 is the sustained access to antiretrovirals because there is nothing worse for developing resistance than to have, you know, interrupted uh, treatment either yeah. for an individual or in a, in a region. Because so it is, the virus yeah. can flourish yeah, in absolutely. a period. Okay. Absolutely. I think we would like to take questions from the floor. I, I, uh, I hope there are some for our panellists who are obviously very well informed and uh, have very interesting insights into all of this. Would anyone like to go first? No one ever wants to go first, but uh, this gentleman here. Thanks very much, all of you. Um, Adam, you mentioned about the PrEP is not just a cure or a treatment, it's a program. And I don't, I could be totally wrong here. Is it fair to say there are people in this country because of the medical system, political system, whatever it is, that are accessing it as a treatment without being on a program? Yeah, absolutely there is. Um, I mean, what we know is that uh, ahead of our health system providing this vital prevention tool, the market did, um, and so a lot of the generic companies launched uh, the product in, far in, far in local pharmacies and community pharmacies in Ireland. Um, even before that, uh, people were accessing the drug online. Um, it, in Ireland, it's, it's illegal to import prescription medication, but the burden of law is on the supplier and not the purchaser. So ultimately what was happened was people were trying to take their sexual health uh, and their HIV prevention into their own hands. Um, going online and buying it online. Um, and then following that, as I say, uh, the, the kind of market provided and it, and it went into the community pharmacies. Um, and as a response to that, uh, you know, the likes of the Game and Health Service, the matter, um, created prep monitoring clinics because, uh, you know, it was so, it, it is so important to ensure that you're HIV negative before you start taking prep. Um, but also, you know, the potential effect on, on, on kidneys and, and stuff like that, which is a more minimal effect than, than, um, than the impact of, of starting PrEP if you're already uh, living with HIV. Um, so yes, there, there, there have been, and that's been a product of the fact that the HSE and, and, and those structures 
uh, weren't in place before the drug was. Um, and I think that's not to demonise those people. I think, if anything, that, that those people should be celebrated for taking control of their, of, of, of their sexual health. But it was about making sure that, that those who are accessing PrEP um, go to uh, their, their sexual health clinics um, to, to ensure that they have the proper monitoring that they, that they need. Um, you met, Nigel mentioned the, um, the, the, the in pharmaceutical interests in having a large population of people buying medications and so on. And it's worth noting that one reason that a PrEP program will be possible in Ireland and one reason that people are able to even purchase this medication in Ireland is because they're getting a generic version of the drug. It's worth noting that right now Gilead Corporation is in the forecourts four contesting um, and trying to preserve a special exemption to um, the expiration of their patent on Truvada so that they could hypothetically retain the very high prices that they charge for Truvada in other places such as the United States, which is like $1,700 a month. Right? So um, Gilead Corporation right now is in the four courts trying to make, force the Irish government to pay a lot more money for HIV medication, including HIV medication that, uh, that, that helps people um, 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 remain HIV negative, right? So um, I, this is why, for example, ACT UP is so attuned to the fact that this is really, these are really political, economic, moral questions around, you know, how, how do we deliver pharmaceuticals to people and whose interests are served? Okay. Who else would like to ask a question? This, this lady here, we might get a microphone to you so that the whole of the lecture theater can hear if, if you don't mind. Thank you. Just a question about the global impact, like what is the UN doing, what are other agencies doing to kind of make the 1990 I mean, that's, that's, that's a big question, you know, I mean, there has been quite a, a joined up response for a long time, but I guess, and something that the danger that always comes with a very specific disease focus like 1990 is that other health priorities fall off the table because obviously funding gets maybe channeled and, and that's, we all know, has been detrimental across the globe, particularly in the, in the least developed countries. So, the, you know, there is a real, effort in the developing uh, world um, to coordinate, to collaborate, uh, and to pool resources to make sure that the knock-on effects of building you know, a health system that can provide access to HIV treatment can also provide treatment for malaria. And you know, we know that by 2030, um, non-communicable dise diseases are going to take over infectious diseases in the developing world as the main killer. So we're going to have to be able to deal with diabetes and cardiovascular disease, etc. So it's ensuring that it is um, it's a development agenda really across the globe that ensures that you know the investment that we're putting into an area like this has a knock-on effect and also you know I mentioned collaboration and you mentioned it, Nigel with respect to the industry and the incentives for developing something like a HIV vaccine we see in the area particularly of, of a vaccine for HIV maybe better collaboration that we see in other areas between the pharmaceutical and biotech industry and public-private partnerships because for the issues that you raise, you know, sometimes for, for an individual company, the incentive to develop a vaccine, you know, it may not necessarily be there because the, the bar is so much higher for a vaccine in yeah. terms of regulatory approval. So that kind of partnership is key as well. So you see organizations such as CEPI, which came out of Davos in 2017 as a result of the Ebola um, emergency, now becoming a huge funding and collaboration mechanism by which mm -hmm. academia can collaborate with industry, can co collaborate with you know, other um, interested researchers to really drive it along. So yeah, it's, 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 it's a concerted approach basically at a global level. And kind of uh, Ebola, you know, that's a mm. good example of being able to really push forward a vaccine yeah. because it was an emergency situation. Ebola was spreading across the world. HIV has kind of gone off the boil uh, and there it still will require all those regulatory hurdles. Um, and, 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 and Ebola has kind of prompted that sort of approach whereby looking again at the collaboration piece between public and private, etc. The, there's a move to kind of looking at sharing key technology platforms, particularly in the case of emergency 
um, vaccines whereby, you know, against a number of antigens so across a range of diseases so that you could look at sharing key technology platforms because these are, as we all know, these are hugely expensive, you know, um, prohibitive for, for, for in many companies. So there, there is a move to kind of looking at that type of collaboration as well because, you know, we need to, we need to get there ultimately. This gentleman up here at the back, he's got a mic too. Yeah. Um, you talk about a lot of um, prevention, but it wasn't mentioned the first level of prevention that will be education and probably in secondary schools or so. As Ireland has moved forward from a very theocratic, very patriarchal society to more secular the last 20 years, what is the quality of sex education in the secondary level? And <laughs> I can your answer. No, look, I like, like, I mean, a lot of um, your answers about uh, drugs and all, it was very informative. And like, I, I was born in the 70s and I went to my schooling and all, and I was right bang on the HIV epidemic in the 80s as a kid, and it was very scary and all, uh, living through it. And uh, I was assuming that in the future, the kids, they will start knowing more things about uh, um, not only the virus, but sex overall. So there wouldn't be that kind of scary boogeyman when you have to talk about these things. So I wonder in Ireland, as we're moving forward as a society, uh, what is the level of sex education in schools? Eh? What are we teaching our kids? It's abysmal. Yeah. It's abysmal. Um, we are in like urgent need of comprehensive and inclusive and a non opt out sex education. Um, I, like, I went to a community school in Tala, and uh, when we were like bunched into uh, a room, all of the boys, um, the biology teacher very awkwardly spoke about uh, like how not to get someone pregnant. Not, not relevant to me. And you know all of these things that were the, the teacher felt awkward. We felt awkward. I didn't get any of the information that I needed. Many others probably didn't either. It was cloaked in shame and guilt. So you know none of us were going out into the world with a good sense of self, of like that sex is there to be enjoyed, uh, or or how to to you know prevent HIV or STIs. Um, and I think that unfortunately has been pervasive. I don't think that that's changed by much. I think. Some schools have done better than others, but again, that's that uneven playing field. Um, and I know that there was a review of the relationship and sex education kind of curriculum. Um, and I think you know there is inroads in trying to make that better. But I think the key part of all of that is the opt-out element, where you'd have this, you know, based on the religious ethos of a school or whatever. If I went to a school with a religious eth ethos. Uh, as, as a young gay person, then potentially the, the, the really important information that I would need so that when I'm going out to enjoy sex, uh, I don't have. Um, so that, again, talking about inequalities in why, for example, gay and bisexual men are disproportionately affected by HIV, that's a clear one. Uh, if we don't have the understanding, the education, the skills around sex and prevention, um, then you know it's it's inevitable that that will uh, rise HIV and, and STI rates. Right? So, yeah, in, in in short, really bad. Um, but I think I think it's hopefully I I think basically uh, after the last kind of in Ireland, so much has changed, right? Really, really rapidly over the last number of years, um, and we've had an opportunity to kind of talk as a country about 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 uh, gay lives in terms of the marriage equality referendum. Now, sex was very much sidelined because, again, the kind of idea that, you know, if, if it's, it's love and it's marriage and we don't want to talk about gay sex. But I do, do think it, like, it brought up an opportunity to have more conversations and, and be comfortable with, with, uh, with the topic of gay. Um, but also, and most importantly, probably repealing the Eighth Amendment and, and the conversation directly around, around sex and agency around that. Um, so I do think you know it's a really exciting time to be working in this area, and I do think that there's there's change, in, and even seeing a room as full as it is today about this topic is a good indication that as a country we do want to change and we do want to make those kind of um, changes happen, particularly with sex ed. Um, but I think as it stands, yeah, not good. <laughs>
96% of the schools in the country are Catholic and they have an entitlement because of their ethos to, I suppose, slant sexual education in this country for people, which does create a difficulty because, as Adam says, there are schools that don't mention the existence of, of LGBT issues at all. And in fairness, abstinence, which is a, a failed concept largely in terms of protecting yourself, is still, is still promoted. They do talk about condoms a lot, and they do talk about avoiding STIs, but they, but they leave out vast tracts of things that might be quite useful, I think, for people. It's due to change, but there has been some reluctance at legislative level to deal with it properly. Um, are there more questions? Who, this, this gentleman here. Um, I was wondering, in the 1980s, one of the uh, in the 1990s, one of the major obstacles to preventing the spread of HIV was blocking by religious institutions against mm -hmm. condoms. Or and I, mean, I know you mentioned political and moral forces which hinder the work. I wondered in your own professional fields, uh, whether it's academic, medical, or activism. Do you find religious institutions today, or religion in general, as an ally in achieving the 1990 goal, or a hindrance? Caroline, you might know. Yeah. Well, yeah, a couple of anecdotes spring immediately to mind, but I won't share all of them. I'll share one, I guess, you know, in Mozambique in the time that we were there. Um, there were consistent messages given by more than one religious leader, uh, different religions, but including, you know, the Catholic bishops that um, condoms were infected with HIV and that they were um, part of the West's mission, if you like, to basically clean up Africa, for want of a better way to put it. So, and, you know, we left Mozambique in the end of 2010. Those kind of strong messages were abating somewhat, but they were really, you know, and the, the power that religion and sort of community organizations have in countries like that are tremendously, you know, they're tremendously influential. So those sort of interventions were, you know, they were beyond harmful um, in terms of, um, of driving the agenda forward. But then at the same time, to give an, uh, 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 an example from the other side, Father Michael Kelly, I'm not sure if people here would be, uh, would know Father Michael, but Father Michael is, a long-standing education, um, educationalist uh, living still, if I am right, in, in Zambia. Um, and Father Michael, being a Catholic, um, a man of the cloth, um, was completely different. You know, he, he advocated for sex education, for sexual health, for awareness. Uh, he, he would get up on a podium like this and talk about dry sex, which is something that would be talked about a lot in taboo terms in Africa. But he, 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 as a man of the cloth, had no problem getting up and talking about it in a very kind of, you know, uh, comprehensive way, in a very... Um, is dry sex sex with a condom? Sex, it, it's... Withdrawal? Well, I don't know what dry sex is. It's, uh, I, I guess, making the vagina kind of drier uh, with, by a variety of methods and, yeah, dry sex. And the, the net effect of dry sex, if you think about it, if uh, without lubrication, the vagina is more likely to tear and to have small injuries. So therefore, the woman is going to be more likely to become more infected. Okay, yeah, so, more so he was against dry sex. Yeah, yeah, he was, you know... Good man. So the, yeah, good man, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, you had Father Michael as, as a man of the cloth doing that. You know, and he was, I think, in his 80s by the time I heard him talking on that subject. And then you had other religions, um, you know, speaking up and saying the Americans are trying to infect us all with HIV in their condoms, so please don't use them. Yeah. I, think I mean, the, they're the, polarized the, examples. The thing to note today, I think the thing to note today on the global scene, I mean, apart from um, the Catholic Church and so on, is the incredible influence that U.S. evangelical churches have with respect to global policy and funding around this area. So the Trump administration right now, because it wants to curry favor with white evangelical Protestants in the United States, is instituting a series of regulations and policy shifts which um, strongly negatively affect sexual health, right? Um, they won't say anything about abortion, et cetera, and a part of that has to do with specific programs targeting, for example, those who are especially vulnerable, such as men who have sex with men or transgender folks. So if you really are like, the, like a really scary place where the intersection of religion and sexual health and so on is being sort of um, shifted is, is the U.S. and its influence in some of the developments in de developing countries. 
I just add to that in a, in a local sense, um, I, like I'm all for bashing the church, but um, in a local sense, like we, we've been working with some of the uh, inner city congregations yeah. so that um, with a rapid testing program. So based on what we've been doing in bars and clubs and, and sex and premises venues for the gay community, working with faith congregations on looking at using the church as an opportunity to test and talk about HIV. Yeah. So I think, you know, I, there's varying degrees. Religion isn't homogenous, and this is what we're exactly. saying, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, we're nearly out of time, really, but we might take one more question. This gentleman is just the first person I saw. Um, I just have a question in terms of the concept of it being called like the global response to HIV that like I want I was wondering if you guys have an opinion on like what the media should be doing in terms of this like when I like I'm in my 30s and like I distinctly remember like the ads with the tombstone and the yeah, you know mean girls ask don't have sex standing up don't ever have sex will stop that like the media it was a very global response to put that out there then and there hasn't been the same response and I guess is like science doesn't have a publicist so like is there is there some onus on the media to push messages like you equals you and prep and pep now? And if so, how do you think I, we I should go about that? I point out as somebody who works in the media that um, the media wasn't funding that. That, that was a government-funded campaign, and the government funds public health awareness <laughs> campaigns, not the media. And if, they pay, if you pay the media, they'll talk about whatever you want. Um, you need money behind those education campaigns, and the money for HIV and, indeed, sexual health uh, awareness campaigns dried up and was completely gone, particularly for the last 10 years in the recession, but maybe the actual panelists might like to address that more. It, it's very much a case of the media will, will, will put ads on if somebody's paying, but there wasn't anybody paying for a very long time. Well, one thing we could do, sorry, one thing we could do is note, oh, so just, I'm just gonna conclude my own contribution by making a small comment, which is that we've imagining that, that this, the problem is somewhere else, actually. We are medicated in Ireland, and it's okay. So uh, in 2017, 41% of people diagnosed with HIV in Ireland presented late. Um, and the percentage of uh, uh, people with advanced infections were 32%, all right? So clearly, we're actually not doing a good job here in this own country. And that access, that ability to diagnose and get people into care is probably strongly affected by inequalities, right? Social inequalities are forms of social marginalization that make it difficult for people to get tested, that make it people, difficult for people to um, access the drugs that can, that, that can keep them alive. And then the other thing is, like, we sort of think maybe we, we, in Ireland we're talking about HIV and in the rest of the world maybe we're talking about AIDS. Eleven people died of AIDS in 2017 in Ireland. Okay, so it's still with us here, right? And then just to underscore the prevention message, more people were diagnosed in the last couple of years in Ireland with HIV than ever before in the history of the epidemic, all right? It's not something that's in the 80s and like now, like it's, there is an HIV crisis happening right now in this country, okay? So um, one thing the media could do is make people aware of that. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree and I think, you know, I think one of the things that stick with me is that if HIV disproportionately affected straight, cis, white men, it would be all over the media. It doesn't. So I think that's part of the reason as to why we don't hear much about it. Yeah, that's right. And I suppose that feeds back into the stigma idea. Yeah. Uh, we're, it's nearly 10 past seven, so we might, but unless Caroline or Nigel have something specific that um, you'd like to say before uh, we finish? I suppose in relation to uh, getting the media and getting the publicity out, we all can do that. Uh, the HRB gave us some money to tell people about our research mm -hmm. and we've made a, a documentary a film with Jonathan McRae, your colleague, uh, that will launch here at Trinity during the year and that's documenting uh, people's experiences uh, with HIV being infected and also having people that have died from AIDS and to try and tell tell the good stories that are happening with the treatment and prep, but also to uh, remind people exactly what uh, Tom said, you know, this is still a crisis and we still have to uh, keep it on our agenda. Uh, so, and this sort of event in Science Gallery, and also, you know, Kira coming to do this, maybe 20 years ago, your equivalent would have gone, oh, I shouldn't be involved in AIDS or HIV, it might be uh, controversial. So I do think we've moved uh, on a lot uh, and we should uh, appreciate those things, but also realize there's challenges ahead. Okay, 
Look, my sincere thanks to the panel, to Adam Shanley, to Tom Strong, to Dr. Caroline Forkin, and to Professor uh, Nigel Stevenson. Thank you very much, all of you, for coming as well. <laughs> and I think, I, think we will be, I think we will be back, I think it's in June again, with the next of the Living With series, and hopefully might see you all again there. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. That was really good.